This code scares me. This function is just trying to process an order, and there are 20 different arguments for this function. That's, that's too many arguments. And to handle all these arguments, I bet the code is really long and scary and spaghetti-like. Hello, and welcome to Senior Code Review Buddy. My name is Chris, and today I'm going to talk about how you can improve code readability by decreasing the number of arguments that a function has. Obviously, I'm not talking about just deleting arguments from a function. I'm going to assume that every argument passed into a function is getting used by that function. Although, if it's not, removing unused arguments is always a good thing. Instead, what I'm talking about is how a function having too many arguments can be a sign of two different issues. And when you fix these issues, you'll probably have less arguments. The first issue is that the function might be doing too much. The function might have too or more distinct sections, and each of those sections should be its own function. A quick example of this could be a function with the word and in it, like update shopping address and credit card. If this function allows you to update the shopping info and credit card info, it should probably be two functions, update shipping address and update credit card. Each of these functions will probably have fewer arguments, and I expect they'll be easier to read as they are only performing a single task instead of doing two tasks together, possibly even two tasks sort of interwoven. The second issue is that the code might be missing a class or data structure. If there is a group of related arguments getting passed around together, it would probably be a win to group them together in a class or data structure of some kind. A quick example of this would be a code base that passes around a credit card value as four different values. The credit card number, the credit card CVV, the credit card expiry month, and the credit card expiry year. Most of the time, if a function's working on a credit card, it's probably going to need all of these together. So you'd probably greatly improve the readability of these functions by having something like a credit card class that encapsulates all of these values together. Then you'd be able to pass just a single argument, this new credit card class, instead of all the values individually. It'd be much easier to parse any function with this new argument as it's only one argument to look at and read instead of four. In addition to this readability gain, by passing these values around together as a unit, it becomes harder to accidentally split them up or mix them up. I've got three examples to walk through today that show how we can improve code readability by figuring out a way to reduce the number of arguments in a function. Let's head over to that first example. I've got a small bit of code here around an address class. We've got quite a few arguments for creating the address class, house number, street, city, state, country, postal code, but I think they all make sense because we need that all to create a valid address, so I'll leave them. Um, then we've got update address and return formatted mailing address. That name seems too long, and it's got an and in it, so I suspect it's already doing too much. And it's got all the same parameters that our constructor had, and also a very long named include country and mailing address. Yeah, this, this function probably needs to get broken up. And if we look at what it does, it's updating every single value so you update them all together instead of being able to do it one at a time and then we've got code down here to generate a formatted mailing address yeah which may or may not include the country this seems quite unrelated to this other than they both work on address but that's why they're in the same class so i think this is ugly i think we can do better i think it's clear that this function is just a giant blob of a bunch of smaller functions merged together. They don't need to be together. I think we should be able to update each value by itself, and we should be able to print the formatted address without needing to update anything. So let's start by pulling out every update house. All right, so with all of those there, we now don't need them in here, so we take them out. We remove them as parameters because they're not needed, and we take them out the name. So this is now return formatted mailing address. I think we can just change that to, we'll say formatted mailing address. One other thing I noticed with this is I don't think we need to say include country in mailing address because we're only returning the mailing address here. There's no other context needed. So I think we can just call this include in country. Oh, and I did have some code down here that I wanted to test. 
Hunt Python. Yeah, and it doesn't work right now. So originally, we'd been setting up the address, passing in 42 as the number, and then had to try to change it, tried to change it to 43 and get the number. And now we can actually do this much easier and say update host number 43. And oops. Formatted mailing address with country. And if we do that, oh yeah, we also got to adjust this down here. There we go. So it's working. I think all of these functions are much cleaner, easier to read, because they all have sort of a much cleaner scope. And I think this is yeah, just much better than what we had before. So Let's go to the next example. All right, this time the code we are interested in is just a little function called is point and circle. We take in the x and y values of a point, the x and y values of the center of a circle, the circle's radius, do a little math and figure out if the x and y of the point are within the radius of the circle or not. Pretty simple. And I've got some tests down below, yep, which are passing. So unlike our previous example, I think this function has a great scope. It's not doing too much. It's just very one clear thing. And all the arguments here are required to do that one thing. But what does jump out at me here is why are the points getting passed in independently? Like why are X and Y two different uh, objects instead of being a single object? Because it does feel a little risky that potentially there could be a spot where I accidentally pass in y x instead of x y or maybe i get mixed up and think the circle comes first instead of the points and you know do something silly like that so i think we can make this a bit more readable and safe if we use a point class to, pla to pass our points around and then for the circle we would have a point and a radius and similar to sort of the logic behind the points well why wouldn't we make it its own class i'm not as worried about them getting mixed up because one would be a point and one would just be float, but it feels like having a circle class to hold them together would be nice because they belong together, they don't really mean much by themselves. So okay, yeah, I think those changes make sense, adding a point class and adding a circle class. So let's start with those classes. So first we would have the point, and then have the circle. All right, and now we can update our classes below our functions below. First of all, that, oops, that's a much cleaner, it's just passing in a point and a circle. I do point dot x, circle dot center dot x, point dot y, circle dot center dot y, and circle dot radius. And now, well, it's a little more work here, but we do need to update all of our test cases. Hmm. And looking at the circles here, I realize it's actually the same circle every time. So we'll just create it once. There we go. We should be able to run our tests. Yep. And our tests all work. All right. So I think with this change of these two classes, this is much cleaner, easier to read, although it's mostly just in reducing the number of arguments. One thing that I think this also helped make clear, though, is the test at first glance before had looked kind of good. I mean, look at all of the conditions I have, must be doing well. But by having the circle there, it kind of became a lot more apparent that, oh, the circle is the same circle. You're only testing one that's based on the origin. Yeah, so I would probably want to add more tests here because I think this using this simpler argument format kind of helped surface that there is some issues here with the test coverage. Yeah. All right. And with that, let's go to the final example. So this code is from a podcast program I've been working on for a number of years. We've got a function move file over impl, which seems straightforward. Sounds like it just moves the file over. But why is it so many lines then? And if we look at the arguments, we've got file. I guess that's the file we start with. Destination seems like where it would go. And the archive folder. That makes it sound like we maybe aren't just moving the file to one spot, but maybe are moving it to two different locations, which means the name maybe isn't quite right, and the functions may be doing a little too much. And if we go look at the code, yeah, 
the first thing we've got here is if we have an archive folder, we're going to make a copy of what seemingly is an important episode. So if it's set and we're not a dry run, we figure out where to put it and we put it in there. And then once that's done, we will prepare the audio file and then move it. Okay, so this sounds like not quite what I would have expected from this name here. So I think it's clear that first of all, this should probably be split in two. We should have one function handle making the archive copy and one function handle updating and then moving the file over. Now, I did make these changes a while ago, so let's check out what the final product looks like. So first we've got archive file, which I've mentioned, and we now just take the file source, the archive destination, and if it's a dry run or not, and we just do, yeah, nice little simple thing here only three arguments compared to the seven move file over had before. I think this is much easier to read and understand. Now, one thing you might notice is that instead of passing in archive folder and computing the final destination, we actually get the final destination here. So part of the reason that I did this change is we were passing in the podcast show name and all that it was being used for was in the case that we needed to generate the archive it was being used to generate the full path. So instead of passing in the folder, the sorry, the archive folder and the podcast show to generate the final destination if needed, I just computed that ahead of time and passed it in as one thing. So we went from having two parameters getting passed in to just the one. So I think that's a little bit cleaner. And I guess looking at this, we maybe could even get away without calling this archive folder anymore because all it is doing is it's copying a file from one spot to another if the other spot is set. Although I do mention in the prints here that it is an archive, so this maybe could change. It's not really specific to archiving anymore, but it definitely I think is clearer than before. And if we go to our other function, we've got update file and move over, which I think is clearer than what we had before. It's showing that we are updating the file. We're not just moving something over and we've got we still got five parameters, so it is a decent amount, but it's not as bad as the seven before. Because yeah, we got our source, our destination, title prefix, speed, values that are needed to update the file, and dry run. At a glance, maybe these two should be in some sort of metadata file for, sorry, metadata class for what we do to the file. Um, but I think that's an idea for the future. Still looks much nicer than before. This is a much easier thing to read. Hopefully, these examples will help you better identify and fix code issues that are surfaced by functions having too many arguments. If you've got an example of a function with a lot of parameters that you don't think is a problem, I'd love it if you could share it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button below and subscribing. If you have any comments, code you'd like me to review, or ideas you'd like me to talk about, please leave a comment below or reach me at chris at seniorcodereviewbuddy.com. Thanks, and have a great day.